My name is Sebastian Sunday. I'm going to be the chair for tonight's meeting in this event series called Mathematical Philosophy um, on the occasion of the centenary of Bertrand Russell's visit to Peking University in 1920-1921, which is hosted by the Department of Philosophy at Peking University, fittingly, and organized by my colleague Yan Jing Wang with the help of uh, another colleague of ours, um, Sheng Yang Zhong. Tonight, our speaker will be Timothy Williamson. Um, Timothy Williamson has been the Wiccan Professor of Logic since 2000 at the University of Oxford. And here we have listed some of the many honors and uh, awards that he has received, but there are really too many indeed to, to list. Um, Timothy Williamson has published very many articles in theoretical analytic philosophy and also many books, all of which have had a very significant impact on the discipline, um, except perhaps for the ones that have been published only very recently. So I thought that um, I could give you by way of introduction, an overview of the books that he has published in his career. Let me just switch to full screen if I can. There you go. You can read the titles. Now, this is in uh, chronological order by year of publication from the top left to the uh, bottom right. Identity and Discrimination was published in 1990 by Blackwell, and a revised edition was also um, published in 2013 by Wiley Blackwell. Vagueness was published in 1994 by Routledge. In 2000, Knowledge and Its Limits was published by Oxford University Press. Then in 2007, Professor Williamson published The Philosophy of Philosophy with Blackwell and in 2013, Oxford University P Press published his Modal Logic as Metaphysics. Tetralog, I'm right, you're wrong, was published by Oxford University Press in 2015. In 2018, he published Doing Philosophy, From Common Curiosity to Logical Reasoning. And in this year, he has already published three books, the first of which was Philosophical Method, a very short introduction, which is indeed the paperback version of doing philosophy. Um, the other monograph he's published is Suppose and Tell, the semantics and heuristics of conditionals. And another book this year is Debating the A Priori, which he has co-authored with Paul Bogosian of New York University. Right, tonight, the title of his talk is Mathematical Philosophy and Philosophical Mathematics. Now, before I will hand over to him, I should just like to say that in this format of Zoom, all audience members can ask questions and we encourage you to do so. The way to do this is to find in your control bar the Q&A button and submit your question. You type your question, it will be submitted to us. We make a selection of a few and Timothy Williamson will answer your question. Okay, that's it from me, Tim. Right, so I should first uh, share my screen. Um, okay. Um, so I was uh, delighted to uh, be invited to, to give a talk uh, in the series on uh, mathematical uh, philosophy. Um, my, my own um, undergraduate uh, degree was in mathematics and uh, philosophy, which is a combination uh, that you can do at a number of uh, British universities. And, and so, of course, uh, I was... I've been interested in the the relation between mathematics and uh, philosophy, and in fact, 
um, R Russell's um, book, uh, Introduction to Mathematical Philosophy, was was one of the the books that I, I uh, first had to read as uh, an undergraduate, and uh, and since um, there's such a thing, presumably as uh, mathematical philosophy, it seemed to me that there should also be uh, such a thing as uh, philosophical uh, mathematics. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk ab about the relation between these two and and try to uh, use that to um, to discuss something about the nature of philosophy and uh, mathematics, but particularly mathematics. Um, oh, there's just a minute. Sorry, there's, we've got a technical problem here. Um, I, I'm going to have to share my s screen again. Uh, sorry, there's, there's some, pro oh, here we are. Here we go. Um, so I'm very sorry about this. There's, there's something, there's some problem with sharing my screen. Oh. Um, I, I can't, I can't control the slides for the, um, uh, have you shared the screen or, um, yes, at I the moment it is not being shared, Tim, you can share it again and try again. But, but, yeah. but it, when I share, I'm really sorry about this, but when I, um, no, you, you can't see anything. Uh, we not cannot now, see no. anything, yeah. but we, we did see something <laughs> before. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so what if you, yeah, you, you, you shut down the PPT, the PowerPoint and then yes. reopen it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe yeah. That's Okay, let's, yes, let's... now we can see the, yeah, your screen. Okay, now, so, so I don't I'm not sure what, yes, that's all right. So, yeah, great, yes, thanks. Continue. Um, so the obvious uh, question is, um, what what is the uh, difference between mathematical philosophy and philosophical uh, mathematics? Um, and, uh, if we just go uh, as we're at the most uh, superficial grammatical level, then then mathematical philosophy uh, should be a kind of uh, philosophy, and philosophical mathematics should be a kind of mathematics. And um, and so uh, one consequence of that is that if they're actually the same uh, thing, uh, if if they're identical, then uh, philosophy and mathematics uh, overlap because this one thing that's both mathematical philosophy and philosophical mathematics would be both a kind of philosophy and a kind of mathematics. Um, perhaps to, to elucidate these phrases uh, a bit more specifically, um, I, I think an, a natural sort of uh, understanding of um, mathematical philosophy and philosophical mathematics that would be that mathematical philosophy uses mathematical methods in answering philosophical questions, while um, analogously that philosophical mathematics uses philosophical methods in answering mathematical questions. Um, now, that, that comparison might not seem very um, helpful, it's a bit abstract and schematic, but uh, suppose uh, we substitute uh, the word biology for the word philosophy just to get a, a feeling for uh, what these two things might be. And uh, we talk about um, mathematical biology and biological mathematics. Then, then mathematical biology would use um, mathematical methods in answering biological questions. And biological mathematics would use uh, biological methods in answering mathematical questions. Now, 
mathematical uh, biology, um, which I've, I've just said uses mathematical methods in answering biological questions. Um, that's a, a well established and well respected kind of uh, biology. I mean, if you're if you're studying the evolution of different populations and so on, I mean, you you, you have to use um, mathematical uh, methods. Um, but it, then, if we think about what biological mathematics would be, that that is that, that it would use biological methods in answering mathematical questions. This sounds very strange and problematic. Um, surely only mathematical proofs should be used in answering mathematical questions. Uh, biological methods are uh, irrelevant. Um, and so it seems that whereas um, mathematical biology is something uh, valuable and important, biological mathematics um, seems um, almost like nonsense. Uh, and so that's that's just a hint of, about what we might think about the relation between mathematical philosophy and philosophical mathematics by analogy. Um, and so if we if we just uh, continue uh, along that line of uh, thought, um, then um, remember we're saying that mathematical philosophy uses mathematical methods in answering philosophical questions and uh, and if we uh, apply um, the analogy um, with with mathematical biology, we, we would expect that it's a well-established and well-respected kind of philosophy, and uh, indeed it is. Uh, so, for example, um, if you're doing the uh, the philosophy of uh, space and time, then uh, you would expect uh, to uh, to use mathematical methods. Uh, for example, in understanding um, Euclidean space and its relation to time, and and even more so in understanding uh, the view of um, space-time in special relativity. Um, and just to give another uh, example, but there are many more, um, uh, formal uh, epistemology also uses mathematical methods in answering philosophical questions. And I mean, the the mathematical methods that it uses are some of them have come from probability theory, some come from um, models of uh, epistemic logic, but the kind of reasoning that we do about those models is mathematical uh, reasoning, or even though we're using them for a, a philosophical purpose. Um, and, and then continuing that analogy, um, if, if we were talking about philosophical uh, mathematics, um, then philosophical uh, mathematics would use uh, philosophical methods in answering mathematical questions. And again, as I say, continuing the analogy, this sounds very strange and problematic. Um, and one might think surely only mathematical proofs uh, should be used in answering mathematical questions, wh whereas philosophical methods are irrelevant. That's what you might think. I, I, I'm not uh, endorsing that uh, view, but that's, but that's what the analogy um, with uh, biology suggests. Um, so if we go back for a moment to, to mathematical philosophy, which, which uh, seems something acceptable, that it, it as something that uses mathematical methods in answering philosophical questions. Um, uh, and of course, as I've just, um, emphasize this is a well-established and well-respected kind of philosophy. Um, and it's also uh, how the phrase mathematical philosophy as used by contemporary philosophers, how it's often uh, understood. Um, and, um, and there's certainly no threat uh, to the autonomy of pure mathematics uh, from its applications to philosophy of this kind, just as there's no threat to the autonomy of pure mathematics from its applications to biology. Uh, the, in these cases, the mathematics that we're applying itself is just regular pure mathematics, but we can apply it to these other domains like uh, biology and uh, philosophy. But, of course, the phrase mathematical philosophy, historically, it's 
associated with Bertrand Russell's uh, book, Introduction to Mathematical Philosophy, uh, which was published in uh, 1919. And I think its contents uh, overlap those of some of Russell's lectures in China, and I guess in, in Peking University particularly, uh, in 1920 to 21. Um, and the way that Russell intends to phrase mathematical philosophy in that book is actually somewhat different from the, the one that I've been suggesting then and that one commonly comes across. So Russell's book is about the foundations of mathematics, not the applications of mathematics. And of course, given his view that fundamentally mathematics is logic, it's also about the foundations uh, of logic. Um, and so in a way, it's closer to what we've been calling philosophical uh, mathematics. Um, and we need to understand how, how that can be a, a legitimate thing. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a very nice uh, discussion of this in the, the first two pages uh, of Russell's uh, book. Um, which which bears on exactly these. Uh, so uh, let me let me read those uh, to you. Um, so he, on the first page, he writes, um, mathematics is a study which, when we start from its most familiar portions, may be pursued in either of two opposite directions. The more familiar direction is constructive towards gradually increasing complexity, from integers to fractions, real numbers, complex numbers, from addition and multiplication to differentiation and integration, and on to higher mathematics. The other direction, which is less familiar, proceeds by analyzing to greater and greater abstractness and logical simplicity. Instead of asking what can be defined and deduced from what is assumed to begin with, we ask instead what more general ideas and principles can be found in terms of which what was our starting point can be defined and deduced. It is the fact of pursuing this opposite direction that characterizes mathematical philosophy as opposed to ordinary mathematics. And then shortly after that, he writes, uh, but it should be understood that the distinction is one not in the subject matter, but in the state of mind of the investigator. Early Greek geometers passing from the empirical rules of Egyptian land surveying to the general propositions by which those rules were found to be justifiable, and thence to Euclid's axioms and postulates, were engaged in mathematical philosophy according to the above definition. But when once the axioms and postulates had been reached, their deductive employment, as we find it in Euclid, belonged to mathematics in the ordinary sense. This distinction between mathematics and mathematical philosophy is one which depends upon the interest inspiring the research and upon the stage which the research has reached, not upon the propositions with which the research is concerned. And actually, even before that, in, in the preface to the book, uh, he, he says some other things which, which cast um, uh, more light on the distinction that he's uh, making. So he, so he writes, um, much of what is set forth in the following chapters is not properly to be called philosophy, though the matters concerned were included in philosophy so long as no satisfactory science of them existed. The nature of infinity and continuity, for example, belonged in former days to philosophy, but belongs now to mathematics. Mathematical philosophy, in the strict sense, cannot perhaps be held to include such definite scientific results as have been obtained in this region. The philosophy of mathematics will naturally be expected to deal with questions on the frontiers of knowledge, as to which comparative certainty is not yet attained. So, if if you look at what Russell is saying, you can see that Russell is inclined to treat mathematics and philosophy strictly understood as mutually exclusive, that they, as it were, nothing can be both, demarcated by whether comparative certainty has been attained. Uh, if yes, it's mathematics. If no, it's uh, philosophy. Uh, although it's not clear that he's always using the terms in the, the, uh, 
those very strict ways. Um, and so, of course, one consequence of that way of distinguishing between um, mathematics and philosophy is that mathematics is by definition uh, epistemologically superior to philosophy in that uh, it's uh, only mathematics has attained uh, comparative certainty. But as it were, that's, that's not being presented as some deep uh, insight into the different uh, natures of these pursuits. It's rather that it's simply a, um, a stipulation as to how the words mathematics and philosophy are going to be used. Although uh, a stipulation to the disadvantage of what's being called uh, philosophy. Um, so for Russell, uh, the justification of the first principles of uh, logic or mathematics, which of course in the end for him are the same, uh, is uh, abductive. So it's, uh, we don't justify them by deducing them from something more basic, because after all, they're the first principles, it, uh, but by seeing what can be deduced from them. Um, although uh, Russell didn't use the word abductive, he, he tended to call it uh, inductive, but this, this is what he, he meant. Um, and in fact, he was explicit about this from quite uh, early on, from uh, 1907. And there are even signs of it a, a bit earlier in, in principles of uh, mathematics. Um, so of course, it's not just um, a matter of seeing the things that can be deduced from them. Um, I mean, Typically, we want some further uh, constraints on the first principles, perhaps uh, as simplicity uh, as far as we can achieve it, and uh, and of course uh, consistency. So it's also a matter of what cannot be uh, deduced uh, from the uh, the first uh, principles. Um, and and Russell denies that the first principles of logic or mathematics are self evident. Uh, and this, this is from page two of Introduction to Mathematical Philosophy. He says, the most obvious and easy things in mathematics are not those that come logically at the beginning. They are things that from the point of view of logical deduction come somewhere in the middle. Just as the easiest bodies to see are those that are neither very near nor very far, neither very small nor very great, so the easiest conceptions to grasp are those that are neither very complex nor very simple, using simple in a logical sense. So, for example, um, I think something that, he, that Russell uh, would have uh, thought of as coming somewhere in the, the, the middle, um, that's one of the most obvious and easy things in mathematics, would be, let's say, simple arithmetic, such as uh, 2 plus 2, uh, equals uh, four, but for him that is that is not basic mathematics. Two plus two uh, equals four is something that actually has to be derived from more basic and general uh, principles, and uh, its derivation uh, in his work with Wright, Whitehead uh, Principia Mathematica takes many pages uh, to to prove uh, two plus two equals four. Uh, from the, uh, the first principles that they have in those volumes. So if, if Russell is uh, right, uh, the first principles even of contemporary logic and mathematics are justified abductively. Um, and uh, just to um, make a connection with the, the lecture series that I was giving um, last, uh, last month uh, and in September, uh, for Peking uh, University, that I mean, that fits very well with the abductive account of logic, which I uh, explained in Lecture Six of the, that Methods of Philosophy uh, series. So um, I'm, I, I should be clear, I'm broadly uh, sympathetic to to Russell's uh, conception of um, of mathematical philosophy and of the of uh, the the status epistemologically of the, the first principles of logic and mathematics. Now, th that raises a question though, when we look at what happens in contemporary mathematics, because uh, I mean, it seems that contemporary mathematics is 
um, fundamentally deductive. Um, it would be hard in, to find in mathematics journals uh, uses of uh, abduction. And so one might think that, that somehow abduction in mathematics uh, has already full, fully served its purpose so that it uh, is no longer needed. That's the, the one question I want to think about in this uh, lecture. Um, and of course, R Russell might say that where we, we are still using abduction, strictly speaking, we are doing philosophy, not uh, mathematics. Now, I, I want to consider some ways in which uh, abduction, um, this, as it were, reasoning in the reverse direction from deduction, um, might uh, still be used in mathematics, so that, as it were, we haven't finished uh, using abduction in contemporary mathematics. Um, and I, I think one natural candidate for that are uh, new axioms for, for set theory, and uh, where set theory is the, the standard framework for almost all uh, contemporary mathematics. It's not unchallenged, but, it, but, but in practice, it, it, it is the, the, the um, sort of normal framework but within which people are, are working. Um, and, um, and so uh, an example of why we might uh, want uh, new uh, axioms uh, in set theory, not, not to replace the old ones, but in addition to the old ones, uh, would be something like Cantor's continuum hypothesis. Um, so the, the hypothesis that would simply no set has more members uh, than there are integers, uh, but fewer than there are real numbers. Um, so th thanks to work by um, Gödel and Paul Cohen, it's, it's known that the continuum hypothesis can be neither proved nor disproved from currently standard axiomatic set theories, as, such as ZFC, that's uh, zermelo frankels set theory with the axiom of choice, which is perhaps the, uh, the, the most popular uh, choice of a, of a set theory to, to use as a framework for mathematics. Um, so the, the axioms of, of ZFC by themselves do not determine whether the continuum hypothesis holds or not. Um, but it would be nice to, to decide the continuum hypothesis I, um, by um, finding a well-supported new axiom let's call it A, such that uh, ZFC plus A either proves or disproves the continuum hypothesis, so that we would actually have an answer to the question of um, whether there is a set that has more members than there are integers, but fewer than there are real numbers, which seems like a, a mathematical question that we might like an answer to. And, and so if we are looking for new axioms of set theory, um, the natural kind of support for them uh, is abductive because we, we know that we can't deduce them. Uh, if they're going to be of any help, we, we won't be able to deduce them from the axioms that we already have. So the, um, the set theorists who are looking uh, for new axioms, are that they're looking for an axiom which satisfies conditions such as um, being uh, simple and elegant, uh, being explanatory. And it, in, in this setting, the um, explanatoriness, of course, it's not to do with causal explanation, um, but it, it might give much shorter and neater proofs of already known theorems um, and unify sort of various kinds of disparate results that we'd already obtained. So we had some independent verification, but, but this this, uh, perhaps a new axiom might um, draw these together and uh, give us a much um, better understanding of why they uh, hold. Um, and of course, we want the, uh, the 
new axiom to be consistent with our evidence. And so we might well take it that, let's say that the that all the um, axioms of um, ZFC are that they're going to be treated as accepted and uh, solid and and so we want an axiom which is consistent with with ZFC. Um, I mean you could also consider some reconstruction which uh, rejected some theorems of ZFC but um, but the most natural uh, strategy seems to be strengthening it rather than replacing it by something quite different. Um, and and we also um, want the, the, the new uh, axiom to be strong so that, that once we add it uh, to the, the set theory that we've already got, we get a lot of new results, uh, including either uh, proving the continuum hypothesis or proving its uh, negation, but other things too. It would be a pity if, if this new axiom really only answered one outstanding question. We'd like to, uh, to to do more than more than that to to be a bigger gain uh, in as it were the definiteness of our picture of um, the hierarchy of of sets. Um, my impression is that unfortunately the search for such new axioms has so far not gone very well, and people have had all sorts of uh, ideas about. Um, such new axioms, but uh, but we're we're not, as far as I can see, in a position where um, we're close to uh, reaching a agreement that it would be safe to to add a certain new axiom to to set theory and uh, and treat it as um, established. Uh, so it, this search uh, is ongoing and. Uh, whether it, it's going to uh, to lead to a a, a positive uh, result is still unclear, but it's still it seems a natural search to be carrying out. Now, actually, I I should mention here that that there is one view um, in in set theory. Um, a view actually of which one of the main proponents is, is my colleague at um, Oxford, Joel David Hamkins, um, which is a, a, kind, a rather non-Rasselian viewpoint, and, and it's often called the, the multiverse view. And so um, this, this is a view on a kind of pluralist view on which it's a mistake to assume that the continuum hypothesis is either true or false, and just and hope to find out which. Um, and uh, the, this alternative multiverse picture is that um, ZFC plus the continuum hypothesis, um, that's true in some structures, while ZFC plus the negation of the continuum hypothesis is true in other structures. Um, and we can investigate whichever class of structures interests us. But uh, on this view, um, no new axiom is needed uh, because th there isn't really a question, does the uh, continuum hypothesis uh, hold or not? Um, it holds of some structures, it's true of some structures and false of others. And, uh, and the idea is uh, there's, there's nothing um, more that we can say than, than that in a way. We, we, can, we just have to choose which structures we're interested in uh, investigating. Uh, and and so on this view that there is no well-defined question that abduction uh, would uh, or might help us to uh, answer. Um, I'm not convinced by the multiverse uh, view, and and so I I want to um, explain what I see as. The, the fundamental uh, problem for it. Um, so even if we decide that, that uh, what we're interested in doing is just carrying out uh, the, these kind of investigations where we you know, investigate structures um, in, in which ZFC and the continuum hypothesis are true and other structures in which ZFC is true, but the continuum 
um, hypothesis is, uh, is false and so on. Um, we're going to have to um, have, a, in order to carry out those investigations, we're going to need a background theory of structures to reason with, a, a theory which tells us uh, what structures there are. I mean, after all, uh, if there are no structures in which um, ZFC plus the continuum hypothesis is true, then um, there's nothing to investigate. Um, and, and, and so we would need to know that. So, so we need to know that there are structures of both kinds in order for this uh, picture to uh, work. But in order to know that, we, we need um, a theory of structures. And of course, a, a theory of structures in the background for us to reason with, it's going to be rather similar to a theory of sets. And it will give rise to, to similar issues about new axioms, as it were, to new axioms to tell us um, more about what, um, what structures there are. And, and it might even be that some kind of analog of the continuum hypothesis arises not as a problem about sets, but as a problem about uh, structures. Um, so, so that um, in a way we have a danger of an infinite uh, regress here. The, the, the sort of non russellian or pluralist view I've been talking about, it just postpones the problem of new axioms without actually solving it. Uh, because at some, at some point in our reasoning, we must actually uh, rely on some principles. Uh, we must use them um, and, and not merely use them to define a subject matter, to say we're interested in, um, in those uh, structures or whatever that, um, that satisfy these axioms, but where we actually assume, in effect, the, the truth or validity of these uh, axioms. Because uh, at some point in mathematics, we, we have to go beyond just making definitions and do some real uh, reasoning. And that reasoning will use various principles and they'll be uh, including some first principles which are not being deduced from anything more basic. And, and all these problems will arise for them uh, too, because if, if these uh, principles uh, have the kind of complexity which will enable us to, to do mathematics with, uh, then th they will be subject to similar kind of um, incompleteness issues to those which uh, af affect set theory. And th there will be questions that um, the, f the first principles that we have in some axiomatization can't answer and where we need to go beyond those principles. So I, I think that in the end, the, the, the pluralist multiverse non-Rossilian view, uh, it just postpones the problem of justifying uh, axioms and even and first principles and finding new ones, it, it doesn't in fact really solve it or dissolve it. Um, now, of course, uh, it may be that the first principles that we uh, ultimately rely on uh, will look more logical than mathematical, uh, but the moral about abduction is still exactly the same, that we need abduction to, to justify these first principles. I mean, if, if Russell's logicism or anything like it is right, then these principles will look like more, more lo logical principles. Um, but as I say, that, that doesn't really affect the issue about uh, the justification of first principles, uh, whatever they are. Um, and of course, even if we don't succeed in finding new axioms that are sufficiently well established that we, that we feel able to rely on them, uh, the justification for those we already rely on is still going to be uh, abductive. Um, and one role, not the only role of abduction, but, but, but one role for it in includes the question of consistency. Um, as it were, the underivability of a contradiction. And, uh, and there are some 
uh, famous um, methodological results uh, about uh, consistency. Um, so in particularly uh, Gödel's uh, second uh, incompleteness theorem. And so a rough statement of a general version of that and applied now to um, zemela frankel um, set theory with choice, which wasn't quite what Gödel originally proved it, but the basic points are the, the same. Um, the, ah, there's, there's a mistake on the, um, on the slide, it says the completeness of ZFC, but that should be the consistency uh, of ZFC. Um, the consistency of ZFC could only be proved in a theory stronger than ZFC. And so in a way in, in more danger of inconsistency than ZFC itself. Um, so, so the idea of um, establishing the consistency of the foundational theories that we're relying on in, in mathematics, um, that itself derives, drives us uh, in, uh, as were, this more abductive uh, direction, because it, it forces us into um, stronger and stronger uh, theories in order to establish consistency. Uh, or alternatively, um, if we don't try to prove consistency, um, if we if we just give uh, inductive support for consistency simply from the fact that that no inconsistency um, has actually emerged in ZFC, then of course that's um, and and e if you in a way an even more um, tentative kind of uh, argument than the abductive argument. Um, but I think uh, that. Um, the kind of support for the consistency of a foundational theory that mathematicians would like, um, it, it's likely to be not purely inductive, but something more like um, an abductive uh, aspect. Um, and so in the, um, in the case of, of ZFC, it, I think that the reliance on it is not simply a matter that we've never found a contradiction. It's also that uh, in some way, um, ZFC does um, correspond to uh, some kind of um, unified um, picture of the hierarchy of uh, sets, um, which so that as where if once we assume that picture, it's it, it seems natural to um, to endorse the axioms of of ZFC, and and it's that kind of um, unification that the picture provides that that uh, that gives abductive support to consistency, whereas um, there are uh, some non-standard uh, theories uh, of uh, sets like um, the Quine's uh, new foundations, uh, which uh, also have not been found to be inconsistent. No, no contradiction has ever emerged from them, but I th where I th the um, the question of consistency is regarded as much wider open than in the case of ZFC. And, and the reason is that these uh, alternative uh, theories like uh, new foundations um, don't, don't really correspond to any kind of intuitive uh, picture of, um, of the set theoretic uh, universe and so that they as where the consistency uh, doesn't have that sort of abductive uh, support for them by contrast with ZFC. Um, so I'm going to mention some other ways uh, in which it, it, there's an abductive aspect uh, to, to what we uh, do in in mathematics, um, which go also go beyond just the search for new axioms and um, arguments for consistency. Um, so set theory as a branch of mathematics uh, is usually done as the theory of pure sets. Um, 
So the pure sets are the ones um, built up just from the empty set. Um, so uh, the empty set and the set containing um, the empty set and um, and as we can build more and more complex um, pure sets out of out of pure sets, but something like um, the the set of all people who are listening to this lecture that's not a pure pure set because uh, as well, its members are are non sets. Um, so if you just look at, at set theory and study it for its own sake, um, then usually what's done is to uh, just focus on the theory of pure sets. But when you think of set theory as a framework for all of mathematics to be done in, and, and you include in mathematics applied mathematics, mathematics applied to the physical world, then um, applied mathematics will use um, impure sets. Um, for example, sets of physical objects, um, or um, let's say sets of different kinds of uh, motion or uh, what vectors or uh, in, in space time or whatever it is. Um, and so these, um, these non sets, um, which we can form sets of and which we need to um, take into account in the application of mathematics. They're, they're known as Ur elements. Um, and, uh, and once we extend set theory to impure sets, we get some new questions. For example, there's a question of whether uh, there, there is a set of all non-sets of all uh, Ur elements. Um, and uh, I mean, some it's quite a widespread axiom that there is such a uh, set, although I myself um, think that there are reasons for for doubting that there are, uh, roughly speaking, uh, uh, reason that there are reasons for suspecting that there are too many uh, non sets or uh, elements to uh, to form a set. But that's a new kind of um, question, which it has a partly mathematical but also partly philosophical um, aspect to it about, well, how many um, of these uh, non-sets are there, uh, are there few enough that they, they will count as forming a, uh, a set? Uh, and, and that's a question which in principle, in, in order to apply ma mathematics um, to the physical world, we, we, we have to have at least some assumptions about um, what sets of uh, physical objects there are, uh, which are not answered just by pure set theory. Um, and again, it seems that abduction will be the natural means of answering uh, those uh, questions as, uh, as well. Um, So, so that's one way in which we, we have to go beyond as well the, the safety of just ordinary pure mathematics once we start thinking about the applications of mathematics. Um, and in fact, the applications of mathematics uh, in natural science, um, they raise an, another set of questions on, on a, different dimension about how we need to go beyond as well what we're just used to thinking of as ordinary pure mathematics. Because we want to apply mathematics to answer questions about uh, counterfactual scenarios. So we want, you know, if, for example, a, a, a lorry, you know, weighing um, so many tons had gone over the bridge, would the bridge have held and so on? And, um, and when we're when we're reasoning in in physics or other natural sciences, if we're interested in laws of nature, we're not just assuming that they hold in the actual world. We're, we're assuming that they uh, hold in any physically possible uh, world. And and then in reasoning um, about those scenarios, uh, we're applying mathematics um, 
not to the actual world, but as it were to various uh, possible worlds. And, and so we need some kind of assurance that, that mathematics uh, itself holds, um, not just in the actual world, but uh, necessarily. Um, and we, we can just give some, uh, some sort of tr trivial um, uh, examples of this, um, where where we're already assuming Im implicitly that um, that mathematics is uh, is something that's that's necessary. So I mean, we can say things like, if you had dropped your pen, you know, in a world where you didn't in fact drop your pen, if you had dropped your pen, five plus seven would still have been twelve. We might say it's physically necessary that five plus seven equals twelve. It's not physically possible that five plus seven equals 13 and so on. And, um, and so even for very elementary uh, applications of mathematics uh, beyond the actual world, we need something more than just the, the theorems in the form in which they might be stated in a mathematics textbook, because this, that, those theorems that they, um, they just say that certain mathematical relations hold. They, they don't have a modal aspect of them in the statement of the theorem that, that they hold of necessity. I and mean, the idea of, um, of necessity, that's not a, a specifically mathematical idea. Um, but we need some kind of principles for the logic of counterfactual conditionals and physical possibility and necessity, which will uh, allow us, you know, given um, that we have these math uh, mathematical uh, results to, um, to necessitate them and apply them to counterfactual scenarios as well as uh, actual uh, scenarios. Um, and I mean, that, that, might, uh, that might seem a little sort of trivial because I mean, it seems surely mathematics is the sort of thing that, that uh, should be necessary, but in fact, these are principles that um, that we do need, and that which go beyond what is strictly given to us by the mathematics in textbook uh, form. We've got to, we've got to modelize it in uh, in this sense. Um, so so when we're thinking about what kind of uh, support we might offer to principles about the necessity of mathematics and so on. Um, again, it might be that the best kind of support uh, is uh, is abductive. That, as we're treating mathematics as uh, completely non-contingent, uh, gives us the the best kinds of explanation uh, of um, of the data, um, which might have to include some modal data about what would have happened if so and so, because we actually have some knowledge of. Of that kind of uh, thing, um, so that um, e even in this kind of simple modal extension of uh, of mathematics, uh, we, which is needed for the purposes of the applications of mathematics, uh, we may be implicitly relying on some kind of uh, abduction. Um, I'm. I now br briefly want to discuss uh, an, another aspect of, um, of mathematics um, where it, it's not as independent of philosophy as you might think. So what we might expect is that mainstream pure mathematics will maintain its independence of philosophy by insisting on maximal precision uh, in its language. So you, know, you might think, well, mathematical language is completely precise, whereas philosophical language is often rather vague and uh, cloudy. Um, but that's not quite the case, in fact. Um, and when you look at um, working mathematicians, they're typically vague about whether the language they're working in for example, is first order or uh, second order. So by, by first uh, 
order, I mean where the quantification is only over objects, we generalize over objects, whereas in a second order, we can roughly speaking, uh, this is a bit too crude, but roughly speaking, we can generalize about properties and relations as well as about uh, objects. And, and so um, th there is a, a technical difference between first order languages and second order languages and which have different uh, properties. But mathematicians normally don't make any decision about which language they're working in. They just go ahead and reason in a, a way which is semi-formal, um, not totally informal, but not perfectly formal either. Um, and, and as it were, it, it, it's, it's more likely to be the, um, the philosophical logicians who are pressing questions about um, exactly which language the, the mathematicians are uh, working in, uh, which the mathematicians are content typically to leave uh, vague. So in this respect, it may be that the, the philosophers are being more precise than the mathematicians. And just to, to explain a little bit about the kind of differences that it make, whether we're work, which kind of language we're working in, uh, in a second order language, a principle such as mathematical uh, induction, that's a principle that if, um, if zero has a property and then for any natural number n, if, if n has a property, uh, then n plus one also has a property, then from that you can conclude that all natural numbers have a property. So a principle such as mathematical induction is in effect uh, an explicit generalization over all properties of natural numbers <coughs> because a second order language allows us to generalize over properties. But in a first order language, mathematical induction is a schema uh, restricted to those properties of natural numbers expressible by some predicate of the language. We, so we don't talk about the properties, we just as we have whatever predicates it is that we can happen to be able to express in the language. Um, and the, the advantage of the second order formulation is that it captures the intended generality of the principle of uh, mathematical induction, which is a principle about all properties whatsoever of natural numbers. Um, but the, the disadvantage of the, the second order um, formulation is that second order logic is uh, incomplete. Uh, not accidentally incomplete, but essentially incomplete, that, that we cannot, that it is not possible to uh, to provide an axiomatization of, um, of second order uh, logic, which um, is sound and, uh, and complete, which captures all the, uh, the validities. Um, whereas the first order formulation, uh, it fails to capture the intended generality because it only, in effect, it only gives you the instances that corresponding to predicates that happen to be expressible in the language. But it does have the compensating advantage that first order logic uh, is complete. We, um, we have a sound and complete axiomatization of it. Um, and, and so whichever, whichever way um, we, we go um, on this choice between the type of language that we're using for mathematics, there's, there's a serious question um, to be answered. Um, so if we, if we go for the, for the second order language, there's a serious question about which logical principles are being uh, assumed. Um, so that's, as we're not totally unlike the question of um, which uh, principles about set theory we should be, be using. Um, and, and so there is, uh, since we can't have a complete axiomatization of this, um, you know, there's a lot of room for discussion about just what principles we should be assuming and what principles we shouldn't be assuming. Um, whereas if, if we decide that what we're officially doing is do mathematics in a, the first order language, then there's a serious question about which properties natural languages should be able to express. So as it were, uh, we, we'll get different um, strengths of the induction principle depending on 
what the expressive capacity is of the uh, of the language. And uh, I mean, that's quite important um, when people are um, thinking about formal theories of truth, uh, which often they they um, build on top of uh, first order uh, arithmetic and then adding adding a predicate for um, for truth um, or for being the girdle number of a true sentence or something like that. Um, that by adding a truth predicate to the uh, the language, we increase its uh, expressive power, and that increases the the power of the principle of mathematical in induction. So, so these are some ways in which, once you think very carefully about um, what the what language you're doing mathematics uh, in, you see that there are a lot of uh, choices which uh, in principle make a significant difference to what you can prove and what you uh, can't prove. Um, and it seems that these choices are ones that uh, would be naturally uh, settled on, uh, on abductive uh, grounds. Um, so those questions uh, these serious questions which the choice of uh, language uh, raises, they have a kind of uh, philosophical character, speaking in a, in a fairly loose sense. Um, and the, the questions are um, evaded by working mathematicians' vagueness as to the, the logical uh, background of their uh, proofs. Um, and I think that vagueness is uh, pragmatically justified in the sense that, that um, for the uh, immediate purposes of the mathematicians, they don't really need to um, decide these questions because they can probably manage to do what they're doing whichever way they go on them. But it's, um, it's kind of logically unsatisfying and uh, and it's a way uh, in which, um, in some sense, the, the philosophers who are pushing these questions are, are more precise than, than the, the mathematicians. Um, and, uh, and so uh, it, it, it is not, it's not the case that, um, that as well, the contrast between mathematics and philosophy here is, is a contrast between the precision of mathematics and the vagueness of philosophy. In, in these examples, it's the other way around. Um, so, so just to, to sum up these various uh, considerations that I've been uh, discussing, um, I think there is no sharp separation between mathematical philosophy in Russell's sense and regular uh, mathematics. Um, even in Russell's case here, when he tried to make the separation, he only made it in terms of what he described as comparative certainty, which is itself quite a, a vague uh, notion. But um, I mean, what, what we've seen is that mathematicians have found a way of doing mathematics, which allows them not to think like philosophers, but just to use deduction from generally accepted first uh, principles, whose ultimate support is uh, abductive. Um, so that as it were, the, the, they can avoid uh, these philosophical questions, but it's not at all that these philosophical questions are mathematically irrelevant. It's just that you can do quite a lot of mathematics without thinking about them. Um, and so um, there's, there's no um, deep way um, in which uh, mathematics is a philosophy uh, free zone. There's a kind of, for practical purposes, we can have a line between mathematics and uh, philosophy. But once we, we start um, pressing certain questions, uh, we, we realize that the, um, the division it is, at certain points, is quite a superficial one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Williamson, for this interesting lecture. Now, 
we have uh, about half an hour for discussion. And I should like to remind everyone how that works because we have a very large audience. We can't just allow everyone to open their mic and start talking, but everyone who wants to can share their comments or questions. And the way to do that is to use in Zoom the control bar. You click on Q and A and you type up your question and then uh, my colleagues will select a few for Professor Williamson to, to answer. All right, so why, while everyone in the background is still selecting those questions, I will just use my uh, privilege as a chair and ask one question that, uh, that I had for, for you, Tim, if I may. So given your view about the relation of mathematics and philosophy, that you've presented today, especially on um, what uh, philosophical mathematics should be. Um, do you think that today there should perhaps be more cooperation than there is between philosophers and mathematicians in order to advance philosophical mathematics? And I, I suppose that you do. Um, if you do, then what do you think, what sorts of cooperation may be most efficient to do that? For example, would you even suggest that mathematics departments should start hiring philosophers to teach their students philosophical mathematics? Well, yes, yeah, so I do. I do think there's more scope for it, and and some of that is being done. So, um, the, for example, uh, at um, at Bristol University, um, they, they they a few years ago they they appointed. A, very fine um, logician, uh, actually a Japanese uh, logician, Ken, uh, Kentaro Fujimoto, who, and that was a, a joint appointment between the mathematics department and the and the philosophy department. And I was a natural one for them to make because they, they were, even before he was appointed, they had um, mathematicians with philosophical interests and um, and philosophers with mathematical uh, interests and um, you know I think um, w one thing that you you see is um, is people sometimes move between departments of mathematics and departments of uh, philosophy. So uh, I mentioned my colleague um, Joel David Hamkins, who, who um, w when he when he was in uh, teaching in New York, he was um, in the um, the mathematics. Uh, department of City University, and now he's in Oxford in the philosophy uh, faculty. But I mean, you know, but in both cases, he had contacts with the uh, the other side. And um, at uh, in the Harvard philosophy department, they um, they have uh, Hugh Wooden, uh, who's a very distinguished set theorist, who was previously in the um, in the mathematics department, I think, at Berkeley. But um, and and so. And so that ex exists. I mean, I don't, I don't expect it to become, as it were, something, uh, you know, a very large proportion of what you you see um, in either philosophy departments or mathematics departments, because um, you know, I, I think it's a little bit like um, the case. You know, if you take the case of physics, um, most most of physics um, has no very special philosophical aspect to it and 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 uh, it would be and so it'd be weird to have philosophers you know involved but but then of course when you look at things like um special relativity and um and uh, quantum and the interpretation of quantum mechanics th th those are some those bits of physics um which uh have uh a very clearly philosophical aspect, which I think, you know, and, and physicists who are interested in them can see that, it, that there's something philosophical about this. And so I think we're, we're only, we're talking as it were at, or, or about the, the most theoretical end of these subjects. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think that, well, I, I you know, I, I think, for example, at Oxford, where we have this uh, undergraduate degree in mathematics and philosophy, I mean, so the, it, you know the, the, that that is is something that uh, that holds the two subjects to, to, together and and gives us sublines of 
uh, of communication. And um, and I, th I think that the, I mean, it's certainly the case that, as it were, the the amount of philosophy that's being done by people who are who are bringing to it a serious knowledge of mathematics and applying that in one way and another is that's uh, increasing and and so uh, so I expect that uh, this will become you know a somewhat larger thing over time but I don't I don't expect it um, to be a, a huge thing just because. Um, you know, most of mathematics is, is is not being is not raising any special philosophical issues, and you know, and can can carry on as before. But as you speak, right at the theoretical end, it it is kind of becoming philosophy, and um, and so I think we, we can expect these kinds of forms of communication. Yes, yes. Thank thank you very much, Tim. Um, as you said, we were talking about the the theoretical. Uh, ends of these disciplines. And so we have a question here on the justification of first principles. Um, you, you can see that question if you want to by clicking on the Q and A button. Yes, I, I, I have it. Right, right. So I will, I will read it. I will read it out for everyone briefly. Um, this question is by one of our students at BKU, Ling Zhe Shi. The question is this, in what sense is the justification in an abductive way for first principles, philosophical rather than mathematical. It seems that you have some assumptions about what philosophy is. Yes, so that's a good, uh, it's a good question. Um, and um, so I, th I think, uh, you know, I don't think that there's any very clear dividing line between um, philosophy and the, the most uh, theoretical uh, aspects of uh, of other disciplines. I mean, if if we were to use um, Russell's criterion of as a degree of uh, certainty, then I think that these abductive uh, considerations would definitely count, count on the philosophical side because uh, they, they they certain they generally do not provide. Uh, anything close to to certainty about the conclusions that are, are reached uh, in this uh, in this way, um, and but I I, I, th I also think that it, apart from the issue of of certainty, if you look at the at the as well the style of uh, argumentation that um, that you get with with uh, these sorts of considerations. Um, there, uh, you know, it's it's often um, much more wide wide ranging and and less purely formal than you see in in mathematics. Um, and as where as where a crude index of that would be that quite a lot of it will be written in ordinary prose and natural language, as opposed to I mean, although there will be formal symbols as well. And um, and so um, it's. You know, in in that kind of loose sense, I think it, it would be when you actually look at the kind of things that people would be saying, it, it's very natural to describe it as uh, philosophical. And um, and I don't I don't think that there that philosophy, you know, that there is some kind of secret, um, you know, definition of uh, of what counts as philosophy that, that um, who, which would somehow um, defeat that and show that these things really don't count as philosophy. So that, I mean, they're they're kind of philosophical, but but I think it's they can also be just. But it would also be perfectly fair to describe them as mathematical. And um, I mean, I'm I myself I, I'm perfectly happy with the idea that some kinds of, of um, argument are both philosophical and mathematical. I don't I don't think we we have to regard these things as mutually exclusive. Thank you, Tim. That, that's a very useful answer. Now, I, I believe we have uh, something of a follow-up question here yes. by Paul Wren, um, who says, yes, I have a similar question to the one we have just discussed. It seems that we are doing mathematical philosophy in a very analytical way. 
So what is the basis of conditions and rules for us to do our proofs and refutations? Or is it only a presentation of the modes of thought that we have when we are studying the philosophical nature of mathematics? Thank you. Yes, so I, I, I take it that this is a reference to uh, Imre Lakatoshi's uh, book, Proofs and, and Refutations, um, where he, um, well, the way he describes uh, what he's doing is, as is trying to, um, as we revive a, a kind of uh, empiricism uh, in uh, philosophy, uh, in, in, math, in mathematics. Um, and, uh, and so I, I mean, I think I think that uh, the, the so he's he has a I mean it's written in dialogue form and um, and concerns uh, as it were different ways of developing Euler's uh, conjecture about graphs and um, it and sh and it shows the um, the way in which there is um, in mathematics that, as it were there can be quite a lot of flexibility about how ideas are applied and and so on i mean i think i think that um the you know if one just takes uh, lakatoshi's argument as um you know by itself uh, i mean the danger is that people will simply say well th this this is the way that mathematics was done 200 years ago but now we've made it completely rigorous and so that so the kind of issues that he's discussing are uh, are no longer relevant. But I I, I think that that it would be a cheap way of dismissing uh, what Lakatosh is uh, pointing out. And um, and so I I'm not at all I'm not at, at all hostile to including the sort of um, work that Lakatosh is doing in um, in this. Uh, discussion. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful uh, book, and um, I, I mean, I I would prefer not to describe it as um, in terms of empiricism. Empiricism tends to suggest a, a, what, in my view, a somewhat mistaken emphasis on the the special evidential role of experience in in some sense. But I, but I mean, I think uh, what he's what Lakatoshi is des describing is. As it were, a way of doing mathematics which uh, involves something more like trial and error than than the a traditional uh, uh, deductive paradigm. And 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 what I've been suggesting is uh, is that that aspect of mathematics is is not something that has uh, is has been outdated by the rigorization of of mathematics. It's it's something that is still with us uh, for quite deep, deep reasons. Thanks, Tim. Now we have a new sort of question here by Ziyu Chu, who is um, a postdoc at our university, at Peking University in philosophy. Her question is this, what is the main contribution of mathematics to philosophy? which isn't already fulfilled by logic in your view. And she gives some additional questions to, to, to help you along perhaps with the main one. Um, is it to contribute new philosophical questions, sharpen the language that philosophers use to frame their questions and inquire about them? Something else? Um, so I, th I mean, it's, it's true that as it were, quite a lot of the contribution of mathematics to philosophy has in effect been mediated by logic. But, but I think there are a lot, a lot of other examples uh, that one can give where, where um, it, it, it's not really like that. So, for, so one, one thing that I would mention, it, um, it, well, in fact, if we t take some, some of the examples I was giving of mathematical philosophy in the, as were the, the contemporary sense. So one would be the, um, the contribution of um, probability theory uh, to epistemology. Um, I mean, so that so that uh, that's a form of probability theory that that was used w without, as you were, it having been. I mean, although in fact there are, of course, rigorous uh, versions of it, but they're not. It's not usually done as a branch of um, 
of of logic and um and then i think that um that for example you know when when people are are thinking about um about the philosophy of space and time and 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 of course that they they're using uh mathematics uh there and um and that the mathematics that they're using isn't uh isn't logic i mean um it's and i mean of course traditionally in the history of philosophy we've um we've had um a, a big role for uh geometry um within within philosophy um and um so I, th I, th I think um I think it's true that 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 mathematics um it contributes some new philosophical um questions I mean uh, for example at, at the at the moment um there's a, a, a movement in mathematics um homotopy type theory, which is, I, I mean, I'm skeptical, but it's supposed to provide alternative foundations of mathematics. And so that's that's raising new philosophical questions about how to think of the foundations of uh, mathematics. Um, and, um, and I, you know, I think, um, you know, in, and if you look in, um, even in moral and political philosophy that um, game theory uh, which is a branch of mathematics. We, we made a contribution there, and all, again, although you can formalize game theory, the the, the version that was actually influential in uh, in those areas, for example, in introducing you know ideas like the prisoner's dilemma and so on. I mean, that wasn't uh, that was mediated by logic, and um, so you know, I, uh, what I would not want to do it would be to, as it were, to have to insist that. That all the contributions of mathematics uh, to um, to philosophy have to be of the the same the same type, um, and um, you know I th I think that um, that they they can they can come up in all sorts of different ways. I mean, so for example, you know, in some recent epistemology that I've been doing, I've I've been using. The, the idea of, of rotational symmetry in thinking about some models of uh, epistemic logic. I mean, rotational symmetry isn't uh, an idea from logic, it's an idea from, from mathematics, and it just happened to be what, um, what I needed for, for some kind of reflection. So I think, um, you know, just as with the, the, the rest of science, I mean, mathematics just has, uh, you know, a, a, a huge numbers of, very powerful uh, intellectual techniques and resources, which can be used in all sorts of of ways, and uh, you know, and it's up to us to 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 be creative about how we how we use them. Thanks for that, Tim. I think those were some great examples. Mm, now we have here a question from Connie, who writes, "Dear Professor Williamson, what is your opinion?" towards the following kind of counterfactuals. If the axiom of choice were false, the well-ordering lemma would fail. Yeah, so um, so I think what we're, I take it that sort of the background assumption here is that, you know, in fact, let's assume that the axiom of choice is true. And, and since, um, since mathematics um, is, is necessary. I was. I, that's the, the usual assumption. Um, then um, it, it's in fact impossible for the axiom of uh, choice to be false. And so uh, this is. I take it this is a question about uh, what, what are known as counterpossibles. In other words, counterfactuals with um, antecedents which are not just false but impossible. And um, the so the. The thing is that um, standard theories of um, of counterfactual conditionals, and and this also applies to my own view, uh, they imply that um, any counterfactual conditional with an impossible antecedent is vacuously true. Um, 
So you might think, well, so therefore these things are trivial and there's no point in talking about them. But, um, but I think that, that ignores the epistemological aspect. So, I mean, supposing we're not very confident about whether the axiom of choice is true or not, but we, we, we still have a, a proof um, that uh, the axiom of choice entails the well-ordering lemma. And that proof, of course, doesn't itself depend on the axiom of choice. And, and so, um, and, and, and that the, the negation of the axiom of choice uh, entails the negation of the well-ordering lemma, that they're equivalent. Um, and so, um, so that, um, that counterfactual is, um, is something that can be, uh, can be proved um, with, a, as it were, mathematically plus a little bit of modalization of mathematics. And, um, and so it's, it, you know, it can be something, it's something that we can use. And, and of course, it, it is true. And the, the, fact, the fact that its antecedent is impossible um, doesn't, doesn't make the, the counterfactual condition cognitively trivial. Uh, you know, e e even though in in the end you might think in a certain way it's metaphysically trivial, but it's cognitively uh, significant, and and that might be all that we need uh, in order to apply a, a counterfactual like that. Thanks, Tim. We have a question now here from uh, Professor Zhao Ting Su. If we want to use abductive reasoning in mathematics, it seems that we have to choose among competing mathematical theories. But mathematics itself, especially set theory of large cardinality, is not so closely related to practice, and it would be better to study as many branches as possible. You don't have to make a choice. Does this mean that mathematicians no longer need to prove the basis of mathematics and therefore no longer need to reason abductively? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think it's, it's surely true that um, it, in contemporary set theory, there are uh, you know, various axioms about uh, very large cardinals, uh, where, where it's unclear whether we should regard these as true or uh, false, and um, and so um, it seems that it's it's certainly uh, a, a prudent strategy to um, to investigate both the the consequences of these axioms and the consequences of their negation or of other axioms that are inconsistent uh, with them. And, uh, and, and so we can, we can do these studies um, and, and prove all sorts of uh, results uh, about them. But, you know, I, I, what I've been arguing is that we shouldn't interpret that as an indication that ultimately we don't have to make any choices about our first principles. Um, I think that I, that was, that was uh, what I was saying in, in my argument against uh, the sort of pluralist multiverse uh, view that in the end, we're going to have to rely on some principles. Um, and, um, and so we, as it were, we, we have to, we have to take those risks. We, we, we may not need to, um, to rely on certain very large cardinal uh, axioms, and um, and it might be that that relying on them would, you know, in the current state of mathematics, would be a risky uh, thing. But in the end, it, what what we can hope to do uh, is to find enough evidence either for or against them, or against, or for or against some maybe some higher order version of these, and you know, in higher order logic, and uh, and so that we should. Uh, you know, if if we can't decide them, that will simply limit um, how 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 many questions in mathematics uh, we can we can answer, um, and and so I, I think we should be seeking ways in which we can actually decide these uh, these axioms um, at some at some level, because I think uh, you know e even if we just start studying as it were the meta theory of set theory and and proving theorems about models of set theory, ultimately, 
similar cardinality questions will arise in whatever uh, framework we are taking as basic and, and we should hope to be able to answer them. Thanks. Now for a change, um, we will have a question asked by the person who wants to ask it or a comment by the person who wants to make that comment. Um, it's my colleague from PKU, uh, Hong Wang Wang, and I believe she can unmute herself and if she has a video, she can also open her video. Please, Hong Wang. Um, thank you, Xiaosai. <laughs> Professor Williamson, I want to ask uh, two questions. Um, the first one uh, relates to meta theory. If I understand correctly, when we are asking um, the foundations, general ideas, and the principles of mathematics, we are actually going meta. When we are justifying the foundations, general ideas, and the principles, of um, mathematics, we are doing meta -math mathematics. Since in no deep way, mathematics is philosophy free. So what's the difference between doing meta -math mathematics and doing philosophy? How do you think of philosophy as meta theory of theories? The second question relates to ambiguity. In his introduction to mathematical philosophy, Russell explicitly uh, proposed his um, logicism and uh, the identity of logic and the mathematics. In your lecture six of the Masters of Philosophy series, logic is taken as part of philosophy, specifically as part of uh, metaphysics. But I'm afraid neither you nor Russell would agree with mathematics as part of metaphysics. There is a considerable ambiguity about um, what uh, logic means in different contexts. Would you like to make some clarification? Uh, clarification? Thank you. Oh, so thank you for your uh, question. Um, so, it, oh, um, is that, okay. I'm, I'm looking for the, sorry, I've, I've lost the, the, the question now. It was, um, yes, thank you. Uh, it, it's helpful for me to have it in front of me. Um, so a lot of metamathematics um, is is basically just a branch of of mathematics, um, and um, I mean so. For example, uh, meta mathematics includes um, includes model theory, um, and well, at the level of meta logic, that um, it, it would also inc include uh, proof theory, and um, a much of what is done in those areas is done by as were normal mathematical methods. So that although there's some kind of philosophical interest in what's being done, um, it, uh, the actual theorems that are being proved are being proved by standard mathematical means. So in that sense, that it's it's not it's not that meta mathematics is typically using more for, as it were uh, arguments that are to more philosophical in style. I mean, it, it, it may do in some places, uh, but but not generally. Um, and um, and and it's also the case that that sometimes um, when we're thinking about foundations, we, we may not go um, meta. We we may just actually um, reason about um, sets or whatever it is the, themselves, rather than reason about uh, set theories. So I I don't I don't think that that meta mathematics. And philosophy. I mean, they they overlap, it, um, but uh, but they're not equivalent. Um, and then your second question was about the relation between mathematics and uh, metaphysics. And um, again, I I think there is some uh, overlap uh, between them because, um, for example. Uh, set theory uh, does uh, have all sorts of, as it were, existential theorems about saying that there are sets of certain kinds and so on. And uh, although um, some people have tried to sort of reinterpret them as, uh, as somehow ontologically neutral, I, th I think that 
that that tends to uh, avoid uh, involve making rather dubious uh, assumptions about the the meaning of set theoretical language and and you know I, th I think the as it were um, the fact that that mathematics is telling us that there are in effect abstract objects of various kinds is itself philosophically um, significant and um, and you know if if you take something which is in some ways not so different from um, set theory, which is Mariology, the study of parts and wholes. I think Mariology is, is normally regarded um, as uh, a part of, um, of metaphysics, um, but, but it's something that can also be um, studied in a purely mathematical uh, way. So, um, so I, don't, I, I don't think that there is any clear dividing line, and um, you know, and I and I don't I don't think that that really we 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 need um, extremely uh, precisely demarcated lines between these different subjects. I mean, we you know we 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 have enough um, sense of the, the that we can use them uh, effectively and. Um, and you know we 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 make, I mean the, the, you know the, the department of, of philosophy will maybe be in a different building from the department of mathematics and so on. But um, but those kind of as it were geographical and institutional distinctions are, don't really correspond to anything um, that's nearly as sharp as that. Um, you know in terms of the content of these disciplines and you know and I think it's in a way it's better to keep things relatively loose and perhaps a bit uh, vague uh, in order not to to block fruitful inter intellectual interaction between these different uh, inquiries. Thank you thank you Tim and thank you Hong Guang. Now we're running a little bit over time but I think we can do one last uh, exchange yes Tim? Yeah, sure, absolutely. There's, there's um, a comment and a question from Lu Chen. Can you see it? Yes. I will read it out. The same, I think this is one, one and the same physical theory, for example, general relativity, usually has many alternative mathematical formulations. Evaluating those formulations and coming up with better formulations that are ontologically and ideologically perspicuous seem to be tasks of mathematical philosophy. What do you think? Um, well, mathematical philosophy may, may be able to uh, contribute uh, to them, but of course, I think it's it's also um, this is something that has to involve uh, the physics uh, as as well, because. Um, I mean, a point that actually that I, I've heard uh, Roger Penrose, uh, who recently won the Nobel Prize in Physics, um, make is that um, when you have different but mathematically uh, equivalent um, formulations of the same theory, it's often the case that, that the different formulations naturally suggest different kinds of generalization. Um, and so, you know, although the, the, the immediate formulations are equivalent, but the generalizations that, that, that are natural are not equivalent. And, um, and so, you know, I think it's, you know, the, 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 as well, the reasons for, um, for choosing between these different formulations, um, you know, are themselves, it's not just a matter of getting them in the neatest philosophical form it's also that that these these have um you know impo importance in physics that that some formulations will be more fruitful for uh for physics or whatever natural science it is than than others and and so um you know i don't think we should forget forget the the role of the natural scientists here as well it, it's where it's not that they've done their work and they can walk away and leave us to formalize it that the the decisions about how to formalize it are themselves decisions with uh implications for the for the future of of the 
these natural sciences um, as well. Um, and then I see there was one last question, which, which is, can I ask what is your opinion towards Badiou's idea that ma mathematics and set theory is ontology? So um, I, I'm not sure that uh, I would say that it, it just is ontology. I mean, there's certainly lots of uh, ontology that isn't mathematics, but but I, I do, I, I'm not sure if this is what Badiou himself meant, but I, I am inclined to think that that set theory itself is uh, does have ontological um, implications. That it is, re it as we're just taken um, in the most natural way. It is telling us that there are these things, sets, and that there are infinitely many of them, and and so on. And um, and I'm you know, and I think that that's something that should be taken um, just as seriously by um, ontologists as the uh, existence of both um, microscopic and macroscopic uh, physical objects. So in that sense, uh, maybe I can agree with Badiou if, if that's uh, what, he, what he meant. Thanks, Tim. That's a, that's a good and perhaps surprising note to, to end on. That's, that's very interesting. So thank you again for a super interesting lecture and a very interesting discussion. Um, and thanks also to uh, our audience tonight and to everyone, especially who have submitted their, their questions and comments. Yes, okay, thank you to all, all the questioners for their good questions. <laughs> thanks. So I think the, the next um, lecture in this event series is on, on Friday, 4 p.m. Uh, Shanghai time. So see you then. Also Beijing time. <laughs> also Beijing time. <laughs> And who's giving it? Oh, uh, Alan Hayek. I see. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. All counterfactuals are false. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So